What is going on, everybody? It's the Frost, and we're here for our Monday Night Raw review for set for October the 26, 2020. On our way to Survivor Series, Hell in a Cell is in the rearview mirror, and here we are, the first episode of Monday Night Raw, and I'm just going to say it, we got through the entire show, no invasion, no SmackDown coming over, nobody coming over and starting any bullshit like we had over the last, oh, I don't know, four years. No invasion. NXT is not going to be a part of the Survivor Series this year, which honestly I would not want to see a three, a six, a ten, a five on five on five triple threat um, elimination match. It just, it didn't work last year. The only thing that we got out of it for the men was Keith Lee versus Roman Reigns. That was about it. But yeah, so none of that. So and as far as I know, we are not going to have a tag team. Survivor Series elimination match because there are no tag teams. There are absolutely no tag teams. Zero. Zilch. Nada. So, one thing that WWE did this year is that they have qualifying matches to see who will be representing the men's teams for Raw. For Raw, at least. I don't know about SmackDown. Probably SmackDown, too. The women, of course, you really can't do qualifying matches because there's not enough women to have because it's five on five. There's not. I don't think they have ten women on the roster. So that is why they didn't have that they didn't have qualifying matches. But we did have we could, we did have one qualifying match and it was for the final spot of the women's for the women's raw team. So we start the show off and Drew McIntyre makes his way to the ring. Drew McIntyre lost of course losing the championship last night to Randy Orton. He says he's been trying to find the words for his title loss to Randy Orton, but he doesn't want to make excuses. But he does promise he will be WWE champion again. Not this year, maybe next year. Maybe he's the one who turns on. Maybe he turns heel and beats Edge for it next year. That would be something. And he's always gotten back up. Twice as stronger after getting knocked down. We get we see the fans in a virtual crowd cheering. He mentions being in such a good mood after Hell in a Cell loss and the big pump. Through the table from the cell. He says if he knew what was going on in his head right now. You'd be afraid. He starts to talk some more. But out comes the new Mr. Money in the Bank. Ms. and John Morrison. If you did not watch Hell in a Cell last night. Ms. is your Money in the Bank. After Tucker turned on his best friend. Giving the Money in the Bank to the Ms. And honestly I think that was the right call for them to do. So, Miz walks Drew and tells him the fans got to give him an encore. Drew wants them to both watch their words carefully because he will drop them where they stand. They go on about Miz, and Miz says now Drew doesn't have to worry about facing Orton for the WWE title. And Drew says, what makes you say that? Miz says because he has this, the Money in the Bank briefcase, making him Mr. Money in the Bank, and he raises it in the air. Goes on about how he ha- now has a WWE title shot. He remembers, reminds us previously who he cashed it in on back in all, back in 2010, a decade ago. That was Randy Orton. After Randy Orton survived a match against, I believe it was Alberto Del Rio. He brings up Miz Girl, which everybody remembers. And beating that, the angry Miz Girl in the f- crowd when they focused on this girl... Who just had this look of like, if looks could kill the night Miz won the championship, everybody watching Miz girl, this evil, this mean, this upset, pissed off Miz girl, the entire landscape of the of the world of who was watching on that night would be dead because the, that was the look of death. She gave Miz the look of death for like as long as they kept it on her. That one, that girl did not like the Miz. Miz teases a cash in and mentions Orton will be a guest today on the moment of bliss. He says, let's think of Drew, let's hypothetically think, if Drew did retain his title, then he would be standing here right now, WWE champion, I would be Mr. Money in the Bank, and you would be outnumbered two on one, and then I would cash in, and I would become WWE champion, and add you to that list of those who have fallen to cash-ins. They go on Taunton, um, Drew McIntyre, and Mil- 
Okay, so hold on. My, my note skipped on me for a second. Miz says he would... Oh, yeah, hold on. They taunt him. He hopes he doesn't take another Drew another 19 years to get a title shot. Drew drops Miz with the Glasgow kiss, which I fucking hate that move. I am one of those people, and I might not be... I might be in the minority here, but I hate seeing headbutts to the, to the, to the head by wrestlers because... I mean, just go watch Tony Storm hit somebody with a headbutt and see how she just, like, starts falling to her, like, starts getting dizzy. It's a dangerous move. It's actually killed a wrestler before, and I don't want to see them do it anymore. Drew levels uh, Morrison after he starts making jokes about being, like, he starts trying to talk in his worst Scottish, um, Irish accent. He pleads him when he gets dropped, and then he launches him across the ring in his head, sending him to the floor. Miz is outside. Drew brings Morrison back in, but Miz comes from behind and takes knee, Drew's knee out to save Morrison. Miz and Morrison will cheer up the land, and Drew stomps on his sunglasses. He says he has an idea he's going to run by management, and it's going to be a bad night for the Miz and Morrison. He calls the idiots, them idiots, stares them down smoking. So, this is what we're going to be doing right now. For the Miz, the Miz and uh, Miz and of course um, Drew McIntyre. First off, can we get Miz and John Morrison away from each other? Like I said at the beginning, like beginning of this year, I said this before, beginning of the year, Miz, John Morrison makes his return to WWE, and WWE's first thought was, "Hey, these guys used to be a tag team." So, let's make them a tag team again. Instead of using John Morrison, John Morrison took years away from WWE. Went to Lucha Underground, went to um, AAA, went to Impact Wrestling. Became a multi-time champion. Watch. Champion. And here they are, having him be Mrs. Mrs. Bitch, pretty much. John Morrison deserves much better than what he's getting. John Morrison should be vying for the WWE Championship. John Morrison should be in a much better program than this jackass, asinine shit that they're having him do. It's a damn shame. And it's going to be a match later on in the night. They announced qualifying matches for um, the Survivor Series team for the men. Elias vs. Keith Lee. Sheamus vs. Matt Riddle. And AJ Styles vs. Jeff Hardy. The first match we see for the night is AJ Styles versus Jeff Hardy. AJ comes out with his muscle, Jordan, um, uh, big, big, big man Jordan. I can't say that last name. I'm, I can say it after I hear Brian Zane say it because, you know, you're just repeating what you heard. But looking at it, I can't say his name. I'm just going to say big, 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 big man Jordan. He marches, they march to the ring. Mike Rum does the introduction. AJ hits the ring and poses as Pyro goes off. Jordan stands behind him as he goes to commercial break, back from break. And Tom reveals the officials have approved Drew McIntyre versus The Miz. Reed plays the Miz um, of AJ over Matt Riddle, and it looks worse than, than you remember. Just seeing Jordan sit out there, standing out there, and balls up his fist, and Matt Riddle just, like a coward, runs into the ring, gets hit, and loses to a Styles Clash. It was bad. He takes the mic now and fan, his fans, fans boo him. He says, 2-0. And how the fans have missed him, not that not he cares. Says, the question on everyone's mind, including himself, is why does he have to qualify to be on Survivor Series? Who does he have to prove himself to and why? Adam Pearce? Not only should he be the Raw on Team Raw, but he should be the team captain. The face that runs the place, he brings up his associate and says he doesn't want to be noticed. And I'm sitting here thinking... This big-ass motherfucker doesn't want to be noticed. Well, if you don't want to be noticed, here's an idea. Don't show up. The dude is a freaking tyrant. He's going to have a really short wrestling career when it comes to being a wrestler. I mean, he could be the big muscle outside of the ring, but WWE is going to have to do what they can to try and get this guy to be as in-ring ready as they can because as any big man will tell you, those knees go first. Just because of who they are. It's like the knees will go. And when the knees start to go, it's when he's going to have to wrap his career up. So Jordan won't be somebody that WWE could just, like, you know, strap a rocket to, make world champion, and have him go out there and become a big face of the company. 
It just doesn't look like that. I mean, yeah. But we'll see what happens with this guy. But I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, why are you saying this guy doesn't want to be noticed? He's seven, what is he, seven three, seventy four? I have no idea how tall he actually is. And he doesn't want to be noticed. Kind of hard to do. He said, AJ says that he should be no, he should be a notice to everyone else. He brings up Jeff Hardy and takes a shot at him, saying, "The most cheapest guy in the company. He used an illegal knee brace about a month and a half ago to steal the Intercontinental title away from me, and now I'm going to win this. Like, come out here, beat him, and be take my rightful place on Team Raw." He also, uh, let me see here. <sighs> AJ says his associate will make sure Hardy wants to put, Hardy wish he didn't put the bottle down. Out comes Jeff Hardy. We see highlights of the end of Hardy's DQ loss to Elias and Helen So The bell rings. They go on it. They have themselves one hell of a match. It is AJ Styles. It is Jeff Hardy. Jeff, I, I'm just going to say this now. Jeff needs to retire. Plain and simple. Just watching Jeff wrestle in WWE. On a weekly basis. You can just see how much slower he is. How much, like, how much... He, the death of dying stuff that he's done in his career has taken... How much of a toll it has taken on Jeff Hardy's body. So, yeah, I, 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 He can still go out there and give you a hell of a match, but it just sucks. But he did get... he um. Um, Hardy leaps from the second rope to um to the floor on AJ with a crossbody, but AJ but Jordan intercepts that and grabs him in mid air. I'm like, holy shit! He just caught Jeff Hardy in mid air. Now this was a very it, okay. That was weird. If this was a um, no dispute qualification match, he could have taken Hardy and threw him over himself and probably threw him all the way back to the stage. Just wow. Back for break and Hardy drops him. Drop, I'm sorry, AJ drops Hardy and with a kick to the head. AJ with a brain buster, but Hardy stays in the match. Her, AJ looks for a springboard to the phenomenal form, but Hardy rolls out to safety. We get a little bit more. Or, um, Jordan's watches closely from ringside as AJ nails a big knee to create another opening. Both men are down as the referee checks on them following a neck breaker. Hardy with a jawbreaker to stun. Styles Clash is blocked as the two, twist of fate and a Pele kick. Hardy ends up rolling AJ for a close two. AJ drops... Uh, Hardy drops AJ face first to the mat. Hardy goes to the top, but AJ knocks him off. Hardy hesitates for the presence of um, Jordan. Fan, the fake fans boo AJ. They boo AJ. Hardy gets sent to the ring post at, after looking for a twist of fate. AJ goes up, goes on to nail the foot off form. One, two, three. And pretty much cleanly... Jeff Hardy loses to AJ Styles. Not a not a bad match at all. Like I said, it, it's you're not gonna get any five star classics or anything like that out of Jeff Hardy, even when he was younger. It's just you can see how slow he is. There's some things that he really needs to take out of his repertoire. The Swanton should be only like the Swanton should be something that is saved for big time matches. The poetry emotion is just sad to watch. He could be having a hell of a match, and then he goes to the poetry emotion, and it's like, oh, yeah, Jeff Hardy's old. It's just things that he, he needs to adjust his um his in-ring style. AJ stands tall as Jordan joins him in the ring. We go to replays. AJ and his music stand tall, and his muscles stand tall on the stage. Hardy slowly gets up, and then all you hear is, whack! Elias whacks Hardy in the back with another guitar. Did you really think... That was over. Hardy won, lost by disqualification. Did you really think that that feud was going to be over? Elias comes, um, shatters the guitar over Hardy's back. Elias plays a kick. He stands tall, looking off from Hardy. All right, truth from McKenzie Mitchell. I don't give a shit. A kid to tower, Drew Gulak versus the Lucha House Party. This tag team match is happening for whatever reason. R-Truth comes out halfway through, but everyone tries to pin this 24-7 champion. Lucha House Party end up winning. I don't care. Then we see Huskis the Pig Boy in Firefly Funhouse with a bunch of cakes. 
and tweets and whatever else is going on. So we come back in the Firefly Funhouse with Bray Wyatt dressed up as the Mad Hatter. We see his puppets having a tea party. And his special guest is about to arrive and it's Alexa Bliss for being, and she apologizes for being late. But she brought some special tea. Splendid, says Wyatt. She made the tea extra special, special just for Rambling Rabbit. It's extra, he says it's extra delicious and ask what's in it. She says a little bit of peach, strawberry, sugar, and a secret ingredient. Rabbit wants to know what the ingredient is. She laughs and says, arsenic. And the rabbit, you look down at the rabbit and he looks like he is dying. Um, I, I'm loving this all I am. Arsenic, <laughs> it's just, I, I, I usually would say, wow, that, that's pretty horrible, like dark and stuff. But this is WWE and it's the Firefly Finals. Arsenic of all things, she put arsenic in it. And Wyatt laughs and says she looks like she's fitting right in. Wyatt says he's mad. Bliss is mad. We're all a little mad around here. She asks, how do you know she's mad? He says, you have to be or you wouldn't be here if, she, if you weren't. He goes on how he didn't have to run from any, you don't have to run from anything here. He'll, he protects you and there's only one thing you have to do. And then she snaps into this trance. And her eyes go from being... I don't know if they had her wear something like over her eyes to do some CGI eyes afterwards. But man, she went from Alexa Bliss to the demon. Like she looked like a devil. Like a demon was possessing her. She puts her head down. He puts, his he puts the hurt glove or heel glove over her head. She gets up. You see the eyes and it's like, let him in. She snaps back at him and says, and our fun is just getting started because later in the night she's going to have a chat with Randy Orton on a moment of bliss. We see, her, we see Wyatt now standing straight ahead and thinking back to the Wyatt family compound burning down because of Orton. Rambling Rabbit comes to you and says, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm actually all right. I'm coming home, baby girl. Wyatt says he cannot wait to see Orton in a moment of bliss because it's going to be fire. Bliss and Wyatt say goodbye, wave goodbye, wave goodbye, and they end the segment. And I'm like, I'm loving everything they are doing with these two. I'm going to be honest right now. The Fiend himself, by himself, has been a dead gimmick since February. Even though he won the Universal Championship for a week. And he had the whole feud with Braun Strowman. His gimmick was dead when they buried him against Goldberg. Alexa Bliss comes around, they do all this stuff, which WWE should be paying Adam Lampier because he came up with the, um, with the whole, he, he, he had this idea first, I'm just saying. But, this has been the best work Alexa Bliss has done her entire career. I have been very critical of her as an in-ring performer, as a singles in-ring performer. Then she joined up with Nikki Cross. And that was good stuff. It, high, it, it showed off her strengths. It hid her weaknesses as best they could. Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross for the last year that they were together was a good act. It was a good act for the tag team division and it helped keep those titles being somewhat relevant. But this, this is absolutely fantastic. I don't know who's writing The Fiend and Alexa Bliss. But they should be writing everything. And if they are writing everything, why is this great? And everything else on Monday Night Raw fucking sucks. They show us the recent happens between Keith Lee and Braun Strowman. Lee is backstage with Charlie Caruso. And Lee says Strowman got, couldn't beat him clean last week. So he went down to below the belt to take a cheap sh the way out. Lee says Braun's like to call himself the monster, but next time they meet, he will show him what a real monster looks like. Lee says, but not tonight, because he's focused on the Survivor Series to be on Team Raw. He goes on and says he's about to walk with the Lions. Lee walks off, we go back to break, back from commercial, and producers Pat Buck and Adam Pearce are in the ring. 
Can we not just call Adam Pierce the GM of Raw and SmackDown? Because that's all he's been doing. We had a contract signing two weeks ago. Usually it's Michael Cole who's in charge. This time it was Adam Pierce. Tonight, he's here to name the Smack the Raw team, the Raw women's team for Survivor Series. The tag team champions, Dana Brooke and Mandy Rose, and one final member will be decided in a fatal four-way between um Oh, wait, we're not there yet. My bad. He was in the back. He stopped by tag team champions, Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler. I'm getting ahead of myself. My bad. My nose is just messed up. Says that they are not the ta- they're not either one of the cha- captains. They both gave him papers to who should be on their team. And he will talk about it later. So, then we go to Keith Lee versus Elias. I'm getting so things quite. It's, it's like what? It's eleven twenty-seven. I've been. I've had a heck of a day. I'm. I'm tired. So excuse me for getting things mixed up. Elias is waiting in the guitar. He mentions taking out Jeff Hardy earlier tonight and pl- plugs his new album, Universal Truth. Elias says it's number two on the charts, and he needs fans to help get it to number one. He goes about the WWE standing with for Walk with Elias, which we get the obviously t- piped in Walk with Elias soundbite from a previous episode of Monday Night Raw. Oh, my goodness. So, Keith Lee does big man things, beats the hell out of him. Elias gets away from and moves out of the way, and Keith Lee runs into the ring post. He beats him up. He gets the advantage of last from it. He goes up top, goes up top for something. Jeff Hardy's music hits. Elias is distracted. Lee gets back up, launches him off the top of the mat, Goes for the spear bomb, hits it, pins, and goes one, two, three. And he's going on to Survivor Series. So that's two of the three matches we'll see tonight. Elias is quick, is slow to get up. He is back. He's leaning too much into the rope. So it's obviously that Jeff Hardy is going to come from behind and whack him with a um, guitar, which he does. We see the Hurt Business backstage. The bullying guy from apparently using the bathroom. He tries to run away, but slips and falls. They laugh and we go to commercial break. Back from break, back from break, and Tom shows us highlights of Drew McIntyre versus Champion Randy Orton. I don't to sell. Caruso stops um, Orton backstage and congratulates him. And says she asks him if he's concerned the Fiend might have make an appearance during a moment of bliss tonight. Orton doesn't have anything to be concerned about as it made he had made it out of Hell in a Cell last night. Doesn't care if it's the big dog, the Fiend. He goes on and says the only one that he's concerned about the Viper these days are the ones who cross the Viper. And he walks off. Speaking of things that fucking suck, Retribution. What is wrong with Retribution? Let's see. Months ago, when we were still on the PC, WWE brought out this group of Antifa spinoff. Uh, this, this group of Antifa wannabes. They throw a Molotov into a, what is it, into a generator, causing blackout, like, like, lighting problems, and a bunch of other bullshit. And then they do a bunch of high school shenanigans for a while, and then, three or four weeks ago, T, um, Dominic, Dominic Dajakovic, D- Dio Madden, Shane Thorne, Mercedes Martinez and Mia Yim all showed up wearing masks and face paints on their head, on the on them, and they became and they started cutting promos, in which they were angry that everybody who is on the main roster was making money doing a job, and then they got after getting contracts, and then we get the names Slapjack. T-Bar, Mace, and Reckoning for me again. But Satan Martinez saw this and was like, this is stupid as shit. I'm going back to NXT. That's what I'm thinking. Because there's no other explanation why she's no longer there. She was there for a week, a week or two, and now she's gone back to NXT. Where she fucking belongs. She dodged a bullet. Because then they added Mustafa Ali as their leader. He was the one who brought these guys together. 
And what have they done since they made their in-ring debut? Loss, 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 loss. They can't buy a win. So they fight the hurt fight the hurt business for the millionth time. And it's an elimination match. What do you think happened here? Before we get to that, MVP and the Hurt Business are out there, and they talk about how they ran, never ran from Retribution. Last year, also cuts a promo and say, on fighting Retribution on Raw. MVP says he's made a business arrangement with the higher-ups, which he said, if you're good at something, you never do it for free. That's why he struck up this business uh, proposition. He's Take out Retribution. They have fulfilled their end of the agreement, and they want their payment. Shelton says they want their payment in gold. The outcomes. Retribution. Mustafa Ali makes T Bus Slapjack with Reckoning. Which, oh boy, I'm sure me again would love to be face fighting Neo Shirai for the NXT Women's Championship than doing this bullshit. So, MVP gets eliminated first. Then, Reckoning gets on the apron for whatever, distracting MVP. She acts like she's having some kind of attack. Some kind of seizure or something. More bizarre, Slapjack takes advantage, distracts MVP, rolls him up, and gets the pin. Back from break, and we see a reckoning recovery during the break, and was just fine. She faked the bizarre attack, but was ejected to backstage area by the referee. Lashley works on Slapjack. He gets eliminated. Then T-Bar comes in. Him and Lashley have a fight. T-Bar and Lashley fight to the outside, to the stage, and get counted out. So we're down to... Mustafa Ali and Slapjack versus Shelton Benjamin and Cedric Alexander. Well, Slapjack gets, um, I'm sorry, Mace gets eliminated. Yeah, we're down to Slapjack. Yeah, Mace is left. Mace is left, if I'm correct. Yeah, Mace is left. And Ali is left. Mace gets eliminated by Peter. Ali is alone. And I'm thinking, they're not going to have Retribution lose again, are you? No, they're going to have Ali take these two out and show that he is the actual leader, the strong leader of Retribution. No, or he's just going to hit um, Cedric Alexander with a chair to get disqualified. Yeah, that sounds like a better idea. They have not won one single match. Retribution has been around for months. They have caused havoc. They have made everything just terrible on this show, and they continue to fucking lose. How? How are we supposed to make take this this group seriously? They're supposed to cause havoc, cause destruction, piss like just piss all over the WWE. And what have they done? They have done nothing but lose. They are not a group of rebels. They are a group of losers. Nothing but losers. And I kind of, I knew. As soon as, our, as soon as Mustafa Ali was named the head, the leader of this, that this, this group had no chance. I guarantee you, Mercedes Martinez is sitting back at her house, um, crossing her, putting, doing a crossover hers, like, God, good, good grief, good God, thank you for, like, not having me do this. I'm glad, she's got to be thanking her lucky stars, thanking the resting God, gods that she dodged a bullet because, holy shit, retribution sucks. Angel goes to his backstage with Mandy Rose, Daniel Brooke, he has Rose and asks her about her status with Otis. She says Otis has a rough 24 hours, but yes, they are still, they are still close. He flips with Dana Brooke, some, some with Dana Brooke. They go on until the women's tag team champion Shannon Baszler and Nia, Nia come up. They have a bicker back and forth, and nothing special happens. Drew McIntyre versus The Miz. This happens because of what happened earlier in the show. Drew McIntyre wins in not so special, not a very special match. It, it, it wasn't anything special. There's nothing big about it, but... Morrison tries to get involved. Drew McIntyre ends up hitting a Claymore kick on The Miz, and Drew gets the win. Now, Drew McIntyre beating The Miz is typical for WWE when it comes to somebody who is Mr. Money in the Bank. They don't win often. 
almost never win, especially like it's just it's just what it is. It's like you lose, 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 lose. You make it a um, win here or there. Which if you're money in the bank and you want to be somebody that the champions want to feel threatened about, you should be winning matches. So it's like, hey, this person could clearly become the WWE champion or the Universal Champion. Right now, this briefcase needs to be cashed in and failed because quite honestly, I don't see Miz winning against either Randy Orton or Roman Reigns. Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods are backstage are doing a Street Profits impression. They let us know that they're going to be taking on the Street Profits at Survivor Series. Oscar comes in. They do a bunch of goofy shit. We have the world titles going up against each other. We have the Intercontinental title and the U.S. title going up against each other. The women's champions going up against each other. Typical WWE fashion over the last few years. So that is going to be your Survivor Series. They do a bunch of other stupid shit, and I don't care. The Hurt Business do come in, though. And they're like, hey, we're focused on getting those. We want those tag team championships. And I'm like... Thank you. You should be going for the tag team titles. Knock off the stupid bullshit with Retribution and go after the tag team championships. Now let's see. Charlie stops to be backstage and asks if he's won from his first step to getting back to WWE title. He goes on about how he'll take whatever step he needs to to get his title back and get his McIntyre guarantee. That Orton will have a moment tonight but it won't be with Bliss. Producers, okay, now producers Adam Pierce and Pat Buck are in the ring. They plug Survivor Series for the traditional women's five on five. And like I said, I don't think you have 10 women on Raw minus Oscar, so you would have to have like 11 women to have qualifying matches for Survivor Series. So Shannon Baszler, Nia Jax get brought out. Dana Brooke, Mandy Rose get brought out. Then we're going to have a fatal four way to see who's going to be the final spot. Lana, Lacey Evans, Peyton Royce. And Nikki Cross. What the fuck was that music? They took Nikki Cross's music away. And gave her something that was doesn't even fit her. When you have a wrestling gimmick. When you have a wrestling persona. Your, your appearance is key. Your entrance is key. The entrance music has to fit you. Could you imagine The Undertaker coming down to the ring with um, a salsa dance, like salsa music or um, some kind of reggae music or Metallica or like um, what Will, like a friend of like Will Smith wrapping his, wrapping him down to this um, thing down. What the fuck was that music? I know they're getting rid of CFO music and yes, Nikki Cross's music was the old sanity music. Only it was her version, and they needed to get rid of it. But what in the hell was that? It's like Lacey Evans came out, then Peyton Royce came out, and then Nikki Cross comes out to this music that felt like it would have been it would have fit Peyton Royce or Lacey Evans or even Lana. But what the fuck was that? Sloppy match here, nothing special here except for. Cross, um, Royce runs over the sends both of them out to the ring as Lana pulls Royce out of the ring and steals the pin for the one, two, three, and Lana is the fifth member. Did you really, th- did you think this was going to stop Lana from being put through the table? I got another word for you. Because she comes out, hugs Nia Jax, Max does not let go, John- Jax for the sixth week in a row, puts her in through the, through the table with a Samoan drop. Why are we continuing to do this? The Miro thing happened about a month and a half ago. Maybe two months ago. I can't remember. Why is she still continuing? I guess it might have been six weeks ago. Seven weeks ago. Why is she continuing to be put through a table? I just don't understand it. Charlie Crusoe talks with Randy Orton backstage. He, know, he he says he's not worried that The Fiend shows his ugly face. He has no problem introducing The Fiend to the three most dangerous letters in the sports entertainment, RKO. Matt Murdoch versus Sheamus, Survivor Series qualifying match. 
It was a good match. This was main event worthy because these guys went out there, they busted their asses and did everything they could to say, hey, I want to be on Team Raw. Now, this was like, Sheamus won this match, plain and simple. Sheamus won, bro kick, got the win. One of the biggest things that, WWE, that people are like is like, oh, Matt Riddle's getting buried. Matt Riddle's, well, of course, Matt Riddle's not what he was in NXT. WWE, Vince McMahon doesn't see that in Matt Riddle. But you don't go and have a match this long and that good of a match against somebody like Sheamus and call it a burial. If you want to call it a burial, you would have Matt Riddle go out there, try and do a couple things, and get hit with a bro kick and lose a match within five minutes. This match went very long, was very competitive, could have went either way, and Sheamus ended up winning. The one thing I get tired of seeing, and yes, there were times where people were getting buried. This was not one of them. Matt Riddle is not buried, like, he's not, he's not, he is starting to feel like just another guy. But that's a problem with a lot of guys. Hell, Keith Lee feels like just another guy. If you're not, if your name is not Randy Orton, Drew McIntyre, Sheamus, because he's Sheamus, and you can't really make him be just another guy, because just because of his look alone. Um, Roman Reigns, Edge, when he comes back. You are probably going to be just another guy. Keith Lee is going to be like that. Ricochet is just another guy. Cedric Alexander with the Hurt Business are just another set of guys. And that's a problem. There's no, like, everyone just starts feeling the same and it hurts WWE in the, in the end. Back from breaking, it's time for the main event segment, which is Alexa Bliss in the ring in the latest moment of Bliss. She still has her Firefly Funhouse and Bray Wyatt video vibes going on. She has a her attire she was wearing. It says Yowie Wowie on it. Her, like I'm just saying that Alexa Bliss is just mwah, chef's kiss. The best thing about Monday Night Raw. And it ain't even close. She says her guests went through hell last night at Hell in a Cell to win the title from Drew McIntyre. She outcomes Randy Orton as she introduces him. They talk about how, like the announcers talk about how he could it could be a trap for Orton. She's Set up by the Fiend and Bliss. Orton hits the corner and poses with the title. Bliss tells Orton, You know, you can have a seed. I promise I won't bite. But he'd rather stand. She wants to talk about his super duper. And she said, Super duper win last night. If he put, And if he thought, he'd pull it off. Orton goes on about how he's not surprised by the win. And what he did. And he asks, Do you have a surprise for me? She's like, No surprises. Bliss threatens how Orton had burned down. Orton and Drew burned down the house last night. Orton says, "There it is, burn the house down." He says, "No, he knows Wyatt well, and he knows he's close, and he's going to ask this once and one time only. Where is the fiend?" Out comes Drew McIntyre. He rushes to the ring. Bliss gets out of a chair and sits on the corner. And these two are fighting and they're brawling. And the whole time, you just see Alexa Bliss laughing and giggling and enjoying these two beat the hell out of each other. And I'm sitting there like, love it, love it. She's the best fucking thing on here. And it's not even a fucking, by a country mile, Alexa Bliss ha will be, until, until they really fuck this up and they haven't yet, but until then... Alexa Bliss is going to be Alexa Bliss is going to be the best thing on Monday Night Raw, and I would not have been saying that a year ago, because Alexa Bliss, before she got before she teamed up with Nikki Cross, Alexa Bliss was one of the worst things on the comp on TV. She is the best thing going on t on Monday Night Raw right now. She was one of the best things on SmackDown. SmackDown for a couple weeks had a three headed monster with Bailey, Sasha Banks, Roman Reigns, and Jay, and, and Alexa Bliss and Fiend. Now they only have a two-headed monster, and we'll see what happens with that on Friday. But they're brawling. They're beating the hell out of each other. Um, Orton gets dropped with a Glasgow kiss. LeBliss is just pointing and laughing. She's eating, she's loving every second of this as he, as these two men tear it apart. He goes for the Claymore kick. The lights go down. Lights come back up. It's, it, it takes a minute or two because Orton has to get to his position. But the lights and come back up in the red. Orton's no longer in the ring. It's only Drew McIntyre. He's staring Orton down, who's on the stage now. And Orton just sits there and he stares back for a moment. We go back to Orton. I mean, the Drew. 
Orton again. Orton knows the fiend is behind him. And he does the one thing he knows he can do and what he should do. Instead of fighting the fiend off, he heads towards Drew McIntyre. They brawl. Drew McIntyre, and they, they fight all the way around the ringside area. Drew gets dropped onto the announce table in Randy Orton fashion. Orton gets on top of him, on him. And we end the night with Randy Orton beating up Drew McIntyre on the announce table. Now, it goes off the air with Orton punching him, and that was that. Again, this show just... I don't care about the women's division outside of Oscar, which um, Oscar versus Sasha Banks, we've seen. This is the one thing that sucks about this because they're still doing this bullshit line that it's the one time a year that you, that SmackDown and Raw superstars can battle each other. Oscar faced both Bailey and Sasha Banks a couple months ago. Oscar faced Bailey at some, what was it? At Clash of Champions. Yeah, at SummerSlam, she faced both Bailey and Sasha Banks. At Clash of Champions, Oscar faced Bailey. Oscar's a Raw superstar. Bailey's a SmackDown superstar. How are you going to sit there and throw this bullshit line? Hell, Miz and Otis had a match last night, and Miz is a Raw guy, and Otis is a SmackDown guy. So this bullshit line, and then they also have the brand to brand quarterly brand the brand invitational that they keep talking about how can you continue to use the line ev- like the one night a year raw and smackdown can go up against each other when you do it every fucking other month or every other fucking week it makes no sense but i am also su- surprised but probably not either that they they restrained from doing the invasion from SmackDown to Raw. They're probably going to save that for the go-home shows. The invasion is going to happen there. And we'll see what happens with that. This was your Monday Night Raw review. Nothing special happened other than the um, stuff at the end. Um, Elias and Jeff Hardy is still going to happen. As I figured they would. Again. I will, I'm trying to get into the show. And the only thing that's got my attention. And really is something I give a shit about. It is the Lux of Bliss and the Fiend. Where are they going to go with that? I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm here for the ride. I'm just going to say that right now. I'm here for the ride. And again, I would not have said that even a year ago that Alexa Bliss is the best thing on Monday Night Raw because quite honestly, she is. And it's not even close. But hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video. Find me on Twitter at The Frost Club. Find me on Twitch.tv slash The Frost Club. Find me on Instagram at The Frost Club. And I'll see you guys Wednesday for the second round of the Tag Team Eliminator Tournament of AEW on TNT. Until then, my name is The Frost, and I'll see you guys later.